You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast featuring some of Indiana's most fascinating men and women whose impact has shaped our state, our communities, and us. Join us as we discuss their imprint on our history. Leaders and Legends is brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated, your local veteran business enterprise specializing in public relations, media relations, public outreach, crisis communications, and digital photography. My name is Robert Bain, Principal of Veteran Strategies, former Deputy Chief of Staff to Mayor Greg Ballard, and Communications Director for the Indiana Republican Party. I'm honored to be your host for our discussion. Thank you for joining us on Leaders and Legends today. We have two of the most impactful, amazing, wonderful people I've met in this city, especially in the last 10 years. Uh, They are not from here. But uh, we're going to overcome that because what they've done for the city and what they've done for particular causes and for people they care about is really almost unparalleled. We are joined by Stevie Stays from the City Market. She's been running the City Market for a few years now and before that uh, was involved. Uh, I got to meet her while I was working for Mayor Greg Ballard and also with Amanda Kingsbury, journalist par excellence and a Facebook shamer of this particular podcast because uh, I didn't have any women on the show. So she was going to show up today just to observe, but the hell with that. We brought her in. You've been drafted. Thank you, Amanda, for coming on. Thanks, Robert. Thank you, Stevie, for coming on. My pleasure. Uh, First, you guys are not from here, and I say guys colloquially as a Republican. What is it that impresses you most about your time in Indianapolis? Stevie, go you, for, you go first. So when I moved to Indianapolis, I had just graduated college, Indiana State University in Terre Haute. Um, so it was 1991, December of 1991. And I moved here, of course, when there was a big hole in the middle of downtown Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. Um, Which I sp- became the? Circle Center Mall. That's right. Yeah. Um, and I think just the incredible transformation um, that downtown has seen from a place where it wasn't exactly alive with activity. There really wasn't a reason unless you worked downtown. Um, and then the sidewalks rolled up at 5 p.m. and everybody <laughs> left and didn't have any sort of cultural calling. There was no identity necessarily to it. Um, you know, you had iconic cultural destinations like City Market, which has been there since the 1800s. Um, but really, that was a lunch counter for the downtown employee base because people weren't really living downtown in any you know great number. Um, and I didn't move downtown. I moved to Broderpool, which is where every young kid who moves to Indianapolis. It's the law, right? Isn't that the, the law? law? Yeah. They give you a credentials and, <laughs> and that's what happens. Um, and even then, I didn't start working downtown until later in the 90s, 94. Um, but my life was broader. Well, everybody's life was kind of north side or another side of town, whether it was east side or south side. And downtown was not a destination. And now to walk around, to get out of my office and be able to walk around in a thriving community that is downtown well beyond 5 p.m. When you think about the cultural offerings, the um, theaters, the restaurants. I mean, think about it. 10 years ago, would you have ever guessed that Indy's food and beverage scene would land us in some of the nation's and world's top publications, online and otherwise? And where are you from originally? I was born in Savannah, Georgia. Um, but I moved to Linton, Indiana at a very young age at about three. So Southern Indiana, rural. Linton, Indiana. Linton, Indiana. Go Miners. On yeah, purpose? Linton Miners. Um, well, my um, grandparents got custody of me when I was young and brought me, brought me to Linton, Indiana. Yeah. So it's a town of about 56, 5,700 people. Um, went to high school, you know, junior high, elementary school, all in sure. Linton, Indiana. Yeah. Before we get to Amanda's answer, I met you. I started working in the mayor's office in November of 2008. And uh, Mayor Ballard made the city market renaissance, transformation, however you want to say it, a top priority. Much to the chagrin of people like me, who still believes there should be a McDonald's in the city market. And you know it, what? Bite your tongue. <laughs> Blasphemy. There is no McDonald's in downtown Indianapolis podcast listeners. Someone please put one in. What a tragedy. What was it like working with Greg Ballard on something he clearly cared a lot about? 
Well, it was incredible. And the reason is because his support was palpable even when he wasn't in the office or talking with you about, you know, his vision for the city market, which has just transformed the way people use city market. You know, city market for the longest time was a very transactional destination. You went there to buy lunch and then you left or you went to get coffee and then you went to your office or whatever. And now it is one of those great um, democratic uh, public destinations that people really use as their convention center or is their public space not only to grab a bite to eat but to work out to just sit and have a meeting to really relax and meditate for a minute or to do yoga on the plaza you know there are a million different uses and there's a you know the power of 10 there are 10 at least 10 amazing things to do every day in city market that aside from just buying lunch or buying breakfast or having a beer in the tap room and that gets one of the things where ballard's experience overseas he doesn't get enough, he did not get enough credit for his travels. Yes. You know, 23 years in the Marine Corps, you don't sit in the same place for you know two decades. But he had been to Europe and been overseas in Asia, and he had seen all these places, and he had seen places like the city market. And he goes, there has to be a gathering place downtown. And I think we also probably give credit to Wayne Schmidt, who I know would made it Absolutely. a priority. Yeah, really he was our board it. president at the city market at the time. And I think... As you were saying, it's that human interaction, that human connection, people engaging with people, perfect strangers, or people from your office, or um, friends that you know from somewhere else. It's It brought back to life at City Market that human engagement piece and moved away from the transactional, which is great to see. Again, people are using it as their space, their community center, if you will. That's exactly right, because when I was working in the clerk's office 2003, 4, 5, 6, you get your food and sometimes you just bring it back to your office because you didn't have many options. So you just, it, the transactional part of it, that makes perfect sense. Amanda, where did you come from before you moved here? Well, I grew up in Lowell, Indiana, uh, mm-hmm. which is not far from Chicago. So I've always identified with uh, Chicago more than Indianapolis and always felt superior to Indianapolis in that regard. <laughs> <laughs> Still do to this very no, moment. No, no, that's not true. Um, but when I came here, it was 10 years ago, and it was from North Carolina. Um, my daughter was born, and I'd gotten sentimental and wanted to come back and be closer to parents. And there was a great job at the Indianapolis Star that was available, running Indie.com at the time, which was an arts and entertainment I site remember. aimed right. at. But talking about what Stevie says is, uh, I remember it was painful every week to come up with things to cover in Indianapolis, because you're like, oh, the Stutz Arp- Open House, again. Nothing against that, but... You know, the same thing. And a new restaurant would open every three months. At some point, it changed to where we got so far behind covering the things in the city because things were happening so fast. And it was a lot of younger people who were making a lot of changes in the city. How how many years have you been a journalism professional? Um, Probably about 23. 23. Mm -hmm. When you moved to Indianapolis from the Chicago area, basically, I mean, growing up in Chicago, would you say that Indianapolis surprised you? Um, I wasn't very impressed when I first got here. Um, It it came to surprise me. Now I became very dedicated and loyal to the city. And one of the last things I wanted to do before I left the Star was elevate women in the city and all of the amazing things that they were doing because there's a hidden network of very talented, incredible women in the city that don't get um, covered by the media the way they should. It's interesting because there's, there's a... There's several organizations headed by women, and I'm actually pitching them to be on this podcast, so I probably shouldn't say their names. But some of the most, when I look back at the people who I've worked for, who have supervised me, for lack of a better term, um, other than Greg Ballard, quite frankly, it's all women. Uh, Jennifer Hollowell hired me at State Party for a job I flat out didn't deserve. No chance I should never have gotten that job. It completely changed my life. Uh, Ann Lathrop but the CIB, Doris Ann Sadler. Do you think the lack of prominence is something that women can solve themselves through better networking and better self-promotion, or does it require an outside accelerator? Well, um, I remember going to an Indie Women in Food event a few years ago and bringing up the fact that women need to be better self-promoters. They don't talk about themselves. And I, actually, there was a lot of resistance to that idea, which I didn't understand. Um, you kind of have to pluck them out of their comfort zone to get them to talk about what they're up to and what they're doing. 
And they but, resisted it themselves, or was it? Yes, I, they, they're. You know, I. I don't know. A lot of women just don't like to talk about themselves. It's not that there aren't amazing women in the city, and I also think too that. Um, the way the stars covered them in the past and I've been openly critical about is they're either victims in some fashion or they're cheerleaders with new uniforms. But there's a lot in between that the local media doesn't cover when it comes to women's issues and advancement in the city. It's going to it's going to date the podcast, but that's OK. But t- take a few minutes and talk about the article you just wrote about uh, the milk tooth. I guess I would say she's a founder. She's yes. Part yes. owner or founder of milk tooth. Right. Which I found to be really strong. I'd like to hear Stevie's point of view on this too. Uh, Ashley Brooks, uh, she and I had developed a relationship over the past several months after I'd heard her speak. And uh, I came to think her story, Jonathan got a ton of coverage, right? Good and bad. But I came to think it was her story that was the most powerful one when she, you know, her marriage was failing. And then Jonathan had asked her to resign from the restaurant, uh, Milk Tooth, and she had no legal ownership at the time. So she had no, no recourse. And it was really about but she was doing things quietly behind the scenes that were very powerful and it got to a point where um she's really one of the most influential women in the city no matter if you're talking about food or politics or anything i agree i agree and it's so i was so grateful to you for writing that article um i think for a lot of women we probably read that and as we're reading it we see ourselves in that story in some way um, and you're absolutely right, which may counter your previous statement that you know we don't do a lot of self-promotion. Ashley didn't either. She, it was kind of a slow slog and a quiet slog toward where she is now, which is an amazing place to be. She has a lot of respect. She's a very powerful individual, quietly so. Um, but is that better than carrying a big stick and a lot of and being quote unquote? aggressive, which is as women, we tend to be labeled, you know, if we are self-promotional and we are vocal and we demand a seat at the table and all of those things, um, there are certain terms that are applied to us. Um, and I'm assuming, you know, I'm going to guess that, you know, yeah, Ashley. Yes. yes. Yeah. She's a, she's a friend. I'm going to ask the question. Who don't you know? <laughs> I've been here a long time, Robert. <clears throat> And, and, you know, I've told several, and obviously, and Amanda being on today, for which we're obviously incredibly grateful, and is a wonderful surprise, and I mean that a thousand percent. We coaxed you and goaded you and shamed you, but we're glad that you decided to get in front of the microphone. I told several people that Stevie was coming on today, and they just, they did what you did. They put their hand over their heart, and they just, they go on and on. And so it's, I'm not trying to counter your, your points about, women leadership and uplift and prominence and that sort of thing. But I just know that there are so many women who I either have worked for or worked with and you say their name and the reaction is just, I mean, I'll give you another one. Is there anyone in the city more talented than Alison Melangdon? Right. No, I I mean, it's ridiculous what she can accomplish. She just, she's got the Midas touch about everything. I would kill to work for her. Yeah. Does it, are there, is there a list of people that you kind of, Both of you, Amanda and Stevie, said, like, I look at her and go, wow. Who would that be for you? Where you look at some one or just one or two, you don't have an exhaustive list, where you look at someone and just go, she has got it together, or, you know, man, I wish I could be more like her. Oh, there are so many. Um, Sherry at at Downtown Indy is amazing. Suzanne Kroviak, who writes for The Monthly and and seems to, she's one of those You're about Sherry Seiwert, who runs Sherry Seiwert, yeah. Um, uh, Suzanne Kroviak, who you just wonder how some of these women keep all the plates spinning. They're involved in so many things and active in so many things and really pushing things forward, um, whether it's politically or in the food movement or in health and exercise in 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 thought, um, those thought leaders. And they just are incredible. And you just wonder, when do you sleep? I've been asked that question before. <laughs> Um, but I don't even think I'm as active as some of these other that I have just incredible respect for. When do they sleep? Amanda? Well, I would like to be Cassie Stockcamp when I grow up uh, from the Absolutely. Ashton Pretty amazing. 100%. Especially now that she's off traveling the world and just had the courage to say, I'm out of here. I'm going to go try something different. It's a loss for the city for it sure. Is. Cassie Stockcamp used to run the Athenaeum Foundation. Is that right? Or Yes, I think the that's foundation. Right. She is coming back, you guys. I know. She's she not gone forever. This, there's a finite... Time to this, but there's a hole in the city. But there's where a hole. She was. Yes. <laughs> yes. Who else? 
And I'll throw, and again, I mean, I'm going to throw a few names out there and put you on the spot. Okay. Just to say if you've dealt with them or what you think of them. Well, I know she's controversial, but Betty Cockrum has been an amazing mentor to me. I just think about, you know, people, no matter what you think about Planned Parenthood, just the resolve she had to stand up for her own beliefs. I mean, she used to have people outside of her house picketing all the time. She said she had PTSD for a long time after she retired. Yeah. You know, just going yeah. out in her front yard. She has not retreated. And that's, I think, not a bad compliment for someone who, no matter their cause, gets the slings and arrows shot at them. That's for sure. Yeah. I'm going to throw a few names out there. You just Are tell you going to say Jen Pittman? Well, I love Jen I would Jen say Pittman. Jen Pittman, too. Jen Pittman is... Jen Pittman uh, used to work for me uh, for Mayor Ballard, and then she eventually had my job after I left, and now she uh, is the... Uh, uh, she does so many things at One America, I can't even list them, and she's amazing. I'm going to throw a couple names out there, and you guys just tell me. We'll start with you. Okay. We'll make this one easy because she's a s- sister, uh, Indiana State University sister, Maggie Lewis. Oh. I just adore Maggie Lewis and think that she is terrific. Maggie's incredible. Maggie is one of those people who, when she walks into a room, has such incredible presence that your mouth flies open and you just want to hear what she has to say. And she really commands a room and commands an, an incredible amount of respect because she is so wicked smart. Wicked smart. And she's fun. And she's Great fun. personality. Um, has there been a, a journalist, Amanda, that's like, you've come here? I mean, I know you obviously have a lot of friends and and there are ones that I admire. I think the world is Suzette Hackney. Obviously, we agree on nothing, but I think she's absolutely terrific, <laughs> terrific person. Is it with the realm of journalism? Do you like? Wow, you know, this person's really got it together. Um, someone who's still alive. Take your pick. Well, it's just interesting. I wrote a story about <clears throat> Faith Levitt, uh, oh. who was a Wish TV newscaster who just died at age ninety. I had no idea who she was. But back in the 60s, when her bosses told her to focus her show on cooking and sewing, she basically told them, hell no, women are way more interested in that. And she, you know, interviewed Jim Jones back before when he was just a charismatic preacher. And she would take off her heels to interview men that were shorter than her. But she stood up for women at a time when her bosses really thought women just sat at home and ironed all day and just wanted to hear what celebrities had to say. So I'm channeling her spirit in 2019. (laughs) There's nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, I wanted to talk about another one who's a, a uh, someone who's certainly a pioneer when it comes to Indianapolis. And I don't know if you know her or not, so I don't mean to surprise you, but that's Yvonne Shaheen. Have Yvonne, you ever had any action with her? Because Yvonne she, actually sat on the city market board for a time. She seems to me to be a pioneer is overused, but I mean, a yeah. singularly uh, successful, remarkable, and respected female woman leader in this city. Yeah, I didn't deal a lot with her and this was early days of city market, but I do know that she served, she may have even at one time been president. Um, But I just remember similar to Maggie, just having an immense amount of respect um, because she was, she was a force. She was a force. Did you mentioned Indianapolis earlier, and we're here at Leaders and Legends podcast, hosted by Veteran Strategies. We're here with Stevie Stays from the City Market and longtime journalist Amanda Kingsbury. We talked a lot and with other guests about how amazing Indianapolis is. And for better or worse, Stevie, and I think it's better because of your heart, you're on the front line, so to speak, of downtown's fight with homelessness. Right. Talk a little bit about not only as someone who runs the city market where there's clearly a congregation for lack Mm -hmm. of a better term, is there hope for that? How do you handle it as someone who has to be responsible to clients, be responsible to business, but then yet show a heart. And then I'd like you to tell your uh, heartwarming story, please about uh, the Pacers game. Oh, sure. Um, Well, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, I tend to be very empathetic um, when it comes to our downtown homeless population, and it can even be kind of segmented into different groups. And we've all seen it from um, those who are suffering from severe mental illness to those who have just, for whatever reason, they're experiencing homeless now, but it may not be a permanent situation. Um, but you're right, in terms of kind of balancing what our consumer, what our market goers' expectations are, um, in addition to the merchants themselves and kind of managing, it gets very nuancey. Um, but, you know, we kind of have some 
loose guidelines in terms of, you know, we, we allow people, especially during the awful cold snap that we had recently, we certainly, um, like many of the shelters, you know, pull, pull up those rules about, you know, how long people can kind of loiter and hang out and stay. We're very open. We're, we're a public accommodations destination. Um, so we are, we talked about it being, you know, this democratic public space, and we definitely are. We just, you know, we tend to monitor the activity, what's happening, who's doing what in the market. Um, it's, I don't have any hard and fast rules. You know, I, I kind of, it's a head and heart issue. And I tend to lead with my heart in most situations. Sure. And this is another one that I do. I mean, we do embrace and we do provide resources for our homeless neighbors. Um, we have a program called So What, S-E-W-W-H-A-T, where we have a, um, a local artist who has classes every week to teach our homeless neighbors how to make basic mends to their clothing. So if they're missing a zipper or a button or some, a garment just doesn't fit quite right anymore, they get taught how to make those basic repairs and then they leave those classes with a basic sewing kit for themselves. So we do a lot of outreach to this. Um, I would love to be able to, to wave a magic wand and solve our homeless population issues, but I, I can't do that. But what I can do is work toward, you know, helping them as much as I can. We have several um, homeless neighbors who kind of call City Market home in a way. Um, and I have befriended many of them and they, they're wonderful and they come, they use the market, they buy a cup of coffee and they'll stay and they'll read and they'll, they'll engage with each other and they'll engage with the public. And one day, um, one of my employees said, hey, Dave, one of our homeless neighbors wants to talk to you. And I, so I rushed over and I said, are you okay, Dave? Is everything okay? And he said, oh, yeah, everything's fine. We were, um, a bunch of us were at the Pacers uh, Thanksgiving dinner last night, and they provided us with some mittens and some gloves and and hats, and they also gave us some Pacers tickets. And we wanted to know if you wanted to go with us because you've always taken such good care of us. Now it's our turn to take care of you. And I was like, how amazing is that? I mean, these guys could have sold the tickets on the street and made some money, but they really reached out and said, "You've been good to us. We want to give back. This is how we can do it." So we went to dinner before the game. We enjoyed a great dinner together. We went to the game. We hung out. It was a blast. It was wonderful. Does it, is it hard to strike the balance between clearly people don't want to go where they don't feel comfortable or safe or you know happy with, with providing services that some folks clearly need? Absolutely. But I think that, you know... It's okay sometimes to be uncomfortable with things. I mean, you know, we live in an urban core. We work in an urban core. You can expect certain things to occur in a downtown area. Unfortunately, homeless populations are part of, part of that equation. So as much as I, you know, would love to say that every day I feel comfortable going to work and do, it's okay to feel uncomfortable. It doesn't mean anything bad is going to happen to you. You know, once in a while we have to step over homeless people to get into the front doors of city market and it's okay. My son was working as a bellman at Hilton Garden Inn right there at Penn Inn Market. Mm -hmm, yep. And he came back the next day, you know, after like his first couple of days or whatever, and he was talking with me about it. And I said, Andrew, there's a difference between purposeful and purposefully. Yes. And I go, if, if someone is just, it's ultimately not your call. I mean, you're a bellman, right? But, you know, if you see someone being threatening, you need to tell somebody. If you see someone just kind of acting in a way that you don't see in Franklin Township, then you probably don't need to worry about telling anybody. That's right. And that was my only advice that I gave him. And, you know, I think a couple of times he had to flag down a police officer. But, you know, 95% of the time he was kind of just like, yeah, there's this dude singing yeah. five feet away. And I'm like, is it a problem? He goes, I don't like the song he's singing. But other than that, it's pretty good. Right, right. I mean, your personal safety, you know, does come into play. If you don't feel safe, sure. that's one thing. But just being uncomfortable with what you see. We that that's a, a that's kind of a specific issue in a general series of of problems or challenges facing the city uh, there's something else and i don't want to put amanda on the spot per se but she's the expert in the room without getting specific obviously what is ailing journalism or does or is journalism doing just fine um 
Jeez, where do you even begin with something like this? Um, what is journalism? Are, journalists and journalism, they're under fire these days, probably more than they've ever been. Obviously, you've been in journalism for decades, and I work with journalists every day. Um, there, there's clearly something different about 2019 journalism than there was 2009, 99, 89. As someone who's loves history and loves her craft, trying to take us through just your thoughts. There's no right or wrong answer. Just what do you think? Okay. Well, I mean, I was thinking back to when I would attend journalism conferences in the maybe late 80s, early 90s. Uh, wait, I didn't even graduate till early 90s. Um, anyway, there would be men. <laughs> <laughs> no years yeah, will be asked. That's right. <laughs> um, when I, these conferences, these editors would get up, these men, and they would be like, newspapers are never going to go away because you can't take your computer to the bathroom. Well, you look at your mobile phone right now and you're like, I can take it anywhere. Um, I think there was just a lot of arrogance back then. The profit margins were fat. And I think the people running the show just didn't have any foresight as to what was going to happen. I remember a job I had in the 90s where we had to work hard to convince the publisher to create a website for us because that's where people were reading. And she said, nobody makes money on websites. Why would we do that? <laughs> I guess, I mean, I'm not saying that is not the ultimate reason journalism is in the position it's in right now. There are many changes, including, you know, millennials who just have very different ideas about news consumption and the way it's received. I just think w there were some leaders in the industry that just did not have any vision or they weren't paying close attention to what was coming down the pike. You're the fifth journalist we've interviewed. Uh, not all of them have been uh, broadcast yet, but I want to continue in that theme. Jim Shella, uh, Tim Swearens, God love him, and um, Teresa Wells Denton, and um, David Barris. That's right, David Barris from Channel 8. One of the questions I asked, I asked all of them, what's the biggest change in journalism today from the day you started? And I believe, and Chris isn't on mic, Chris Spangle, but correct me if I'm wrong, they all said, because I kind of prompted them, technology. Would you agree with that or disagree with that? That just the technological changes in how people interact with reporters, news, events, is the diff biggest difference between 2019 and let's say 1999. I think that's absolutely true. People are always going to want information. They're always going to want great stories. It's just how those stories are told and how they're delivered. Uh, it's all about distribution now. Are you dis distributing the information through the right channels? Social media net positive or net negative uh, for journalists? I think positive. Um, one thing I think about too is you, you, you've been in our newsroom or the Indy Star newsroom where you could see uh, the screen and what people were reading. Well, back in the day, you could kind of pretend that everybody was reading what you were writing because maybe two people called you and they were excited about what you did. <laughs> <laughs> now you can look at a board and go, oh, a thousand people are reading my story or two people are reading my story and you can't really hide behind that anymore. Is it how much this is I hate to ask this question because it's an, I'm an inveterate page turner to it. How much does the emphasis on sports matter? Do you think it crowds out? really good hard news stories because people want to read about the Colts and the Pacers and the Indians and sure I mean Indy Star has probably one of the most talented sports teams you know reporter wise in the country and editors and they generate a lot of traffic um, so but yeah I mean I think you know we have one person covering City Hall and two people covering the Pacers sometimes I'm not sure if if, if that's the best way to go at, at what point did you think that journalism turned a corner like it, it you know there there the historical term is watershed right so it it was like this before and that's like this after and x happened and that's the dividing line is there anything that you can point to as as someone you know we've had numerous lunches and uh, numerous uh furious and ferocious text exchanges over this sort of thing what is it that you think made modern journalism what it is now like was it 9 11 was it the internet, something that was like, this is the difference, this point. Um, I would have to say the internet and everything that changed. Yeah, that's it. I mean, I know that seems oversimplified. I don't know that there's another answer that I could come up with, with either. I don't know. I mean, the, 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 it's the speed and the expectation of it. You know, I, I forget when we were talking to, we told the story on February. This is a nerdy history quiz. Um, 
What happened on February 22nd, 1980? One of the most famous events in the history of the United States. No, that was later. No idea. The United States beat the Soviet Union four to three. Oh. The U.S. Olympics. And nobody in the country knew unless you were there because it was tape delayed. Oh, Game was at like seven or eight. Didn't get broadcast till 10 or something like that. I was at the Ellenberger Ice Rink watching on a little black and white TV in the skating rental place. Mm-hmm. Nobody knew. Now, could, is that even fathomable today? That it's an event of that magnitude in the middle of the Cold War and you didn't even know about it? To me, it's the technology and the internet where you you have to be on Twitter all the time and Facebook. And, and do journalists, the journalists face that, see that as an opportunity? Or do you think they see that as more pressure? I think it's a little bit of both. Um, you know, there are journalists too. I mean, after you get beat up enough times that you say, I'd really like to go off Twitter for the next, you know, three weeks. <laughs> it's not an option. Um, but I, I think that the smartest journalists um, recognized 10 years ago that they needed to build their social audiences. Um, some have only recently figured out that they need to do that if they're going to stay relevant. Here's my obligatory, obligatory question. Do you think that there is enough ideological diversity in the newsroom? I think you have your own opinion on that, Robert. Well, I'm not going to state it. It is my show, but I'll defer to you. <laughs> um, well, you, you have to you explain what you mean by ideological. Well, it would seem to me that 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 uh, the newsrooms, not just the Star, so let's be let's be general, that newsrooms are not exactly um, populated by a bunch of uh, Reaganites. Is that a fair assessment? That's a fair assessment. Yes. See. Terrific. And I think what it does is it creates a little bit of suspicion on behalf of folks who perhaps believe like I do, even though I'm not the most conservative person in the world. And that's feeding some of the issue that the mainstream media is having. Is that oversimplifying it or am I just wrong? I think it is. And I think if you were in the rooms when uh, reporters and editors discuss stories and fairness and balance, you would see that there's a much more thoughtful approach to these kind of things than you probably think. Now, I believe, I, you know, I think maybe it was Swearens we were talking to, uh, Tim. I don't know that I've ever, I've encountered a few times where the wording in a story was clearly like, okay, this wasn't written by, you know, William F. Buckley. But I don't know that I've ever encountered a reporter just being unreceptive, non-receptive to something that I've pitched, you know, coming from a Republican or conservative point of view, because that was my client, right? Whether it's the party or the governor or the mayor or whatever. I don't, I've never encountered that. So, so I, I think it can be overplayed. Now, Indianapolis is in Washington, D.C., right? So that's completely different. Um, as I have a question for Stevie. I've been wanting to ask you for a long time, and this is the perfect opportunity because I want to lead into something that you do that I find absolutely amazing, speaking of being able to keep all the saucers in the air. Is the phrase, a dog is a man's best friend, sexist? I don't know if it's sexist. It doesn't make any sense to me as somebody who goes to, you know, a lot of animal welfare conferences and conventions and these kind of things. And 99.9% of the attendees are women. And that's what I wanted you to talk about. For those of you who don't know Stevie, and, and I know a lot of you listening or downloading this probably do, this amazing person with the heart the size of this whole city and beyond works 60 hours a week at the city market at least and then spends her weekends doing what um i do dog transport so and i volunteer for several groups and there are groups nationwide that do this volunteer groups um but dog transport and sometimes the occasional cat or rabbit too or turtle (laughs) um but dog transport uh, is an organization that plucks death row dogs primarily from southern states. They're in high kill shelters. um, And in order to save them, um, they come up to either foster care or a no kill shelter or a permanent home. um, But they've got to get up here. So we do kind of these caravan situations where somebody will launch from um, Georgia and everybody who's volunteering takes like an hour and a half leg of the trip. And we meet up at specific spots and we get them to Canada has been a big destination recently or Wisconsin or Minneapolis, Minnesota, wherever to get them um, to safety, basically. So that it's all great. Like I love doing it because it kind of fills a need that I have to to help. Um, 
but it's all the people are like, how can you do that? It's so no, these are all the best stories. These are great stories. They're great They're pictures all gonna too. Have when you post endings. them on on Facebook, it's, these little faces, these animals. It's just such. And a you work. Soul. It's a five hundred one c three. All of the yeah, all of them are. All right. Well, Veteran Strategies is paying your fuel bill for your next month. Oh. So the next month, you send me your bill for gasoline for your weekend animal rescue travels fantastic i've got one friday it's a belgian malinois i'm really excited that's awesome thank you thank you (laughs) well i just you know you look at other people and they do amazing things and sometimes you think why the hell am i not doing something amazing Uh, i try to help veterans and veteran organizations for free as much as i can i think that's the you know the least that i could do uh and obviously east siders have a blank check and Right. Which they frequently cash, which is wonderful, by the way. And I want to ask Amanda about living in Irvington. But but I look at that stuff, and I'm just amazed at how you're able to pack so much into a week. And God love your husband, because he's right there next to you. He usually is, and he's, <laughs> he's up for anything. If I say, hey, babe, we're going to do this, yeah, okay, let's go. Let's do that. Is, is living in Irvington, Amanda, the best decision you've ever made in your life? I think it is. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, no, what's interesting is, so my ex-husband, Kingsbury, the reason we chose Irvington is because his uh, great-grandfather was the Dr. John Kingsbury who testified against the Grand Dragon of the KKK when Madge Ober- Oberholzer uh, was murdered. Mm-hmm. Madge Oberholzer. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Talk I, about uh, Stevenson. Yes, yeah, do you see? And so... Mm-hmm. For some reason, I just I felt like that would give my daughter sort of a sense of place, um, you know, and I would go out and people would say, oh, Dr. Kingsbury, do you know him? And and all of that. And um, it's and I, I love the spookiness of Irvington, too. It's there's just that eth- ethereal quality about the whole place, eeriness about it that I just adore. And my childhood friend still lives who I graduated from high school with still lives in the Oberholzer house. And my childhood friend, whom I graduated with, his parents still own the Stevenson house. And those are both on the Haunted Tour. Have you ever taken the, the Haunted, Haunted Irvington Tour? There? tour oh, it's yes, amazing. Uh, did it did it make a difference when you when you moved to Indianapolis that you saw potential here? You said that when you kind of came here, you were like shrugging your shoulders, iffy. I don't know that any city has done what Indianapolis has done in my life. I'm 51 in my lifetime, let alone the last 10 years. You know, it's easy for me as a former hack flack for Ballard to give him a bunch of credit. And I do believe he deserves a significant amount of credit, but the collaborative nature that Stevie was talking about earlier, has it impressed you as someone who's grew up near Chicago and, you know, Indianapolis did have a complex and probably still does in some ways. Right. No, Absolutely. It's it's one of the reasons I, even as I'm looking for a different line of work, that I would like to stay here because I do uh, really believe in the city and just watching everything that people have accomplished over the past 10 years. In in five years, you would like Indianapolis, like I'm going to ask both of you, we'll start with Amanda. In five years, you would like Indianapolis to be better at? Wow. Um, God, See, it's I, nice when the journalist's on the other side of the freaking <laughs> microphone, and I'm here asking, who was it? We was it? I think it was Swearens. We were firing all these questions at, and he was. I'm like, yeah, Tim, how's it feel? <laughs> Do you know? Because I'm just gonna say, and it's already coming. Transit. Yeah, I, that's what yeah. I was thinking. That th- I felt like that was the obvious answer, but I think it's the right answer. It's that and sustainability initiatives, which you know we're getting there too. So a lot of great work is being done. You think this uh, red line transit will help the market? Absolutely. City market. I think I think the multimodal approach that we're taking as a city is incredible. A lot of people might denounce or even you know gripe about the scooters. Oh, the scooters! I love the scooters. I use them all the time. But what we've seen is an uptick in business from those other offices, like the government center. Sure. You know, it's a little too far to walk for a lot of people who have half an hour for lunch or even an hour for lunch. It's it's too close to drive and the hassle of finding a parking spot. Scooter is a fantastic answer to that. And we're even creating like scooter parking zones around the market. It's just that combined with Pacers bike share. I know electric um, chargeable bikes are coming online. So all of that is a great approach that not only appeals to me as, you know, more mature person, but certainly the millennials are going to demand it. I just wish they would be a little more careful. I, 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 I'm knocking on my dining room table. 
the thing that scares me most about as someone who rides his bike downtown all the time is sometimes they just don't pay attention. I'm like, oh my God, as soon as someone gets offed. Yeah. Well, I think that. I hate. I, a, you don't want that to happen. And sure. B, you don't want the lack of safety awareness of the riders to ruin right. the program for everybody. Correct. But I have seen so many near misses in just yeah. the past summer. Yeah. That would be my big concern. I think it's probably everybody's. Well, and I think, too, that we maybe haven't done the best job in, uh, you know, disseminating that information about what the rules even are. There's still a lot of question marks about where can I ride? Where can I not ride? You know, because it seems odd that you can't ride on the trail, but they want you in the street. To I, me, it should be the exact opposite. Now, the trail gets crowded. Yeah, and, right. And people who should be on the walking side of the path or on the bike, I deal with that all the time. Sure. So I think there is some sort of like relationship that needs to be right settled. I agree. Um, and and just, you know, like with anything else that's new and fun, you see a lot of abuse to that, too. I've seen, you know, parents with young toddlers on. They're like, what are you doing? You know, put, put a helmet on, you know, obey the rules. You know, you're supposed to be 18 and above. Just, you know, basic kind of approach to it. That Have you hit city markets in other cities? I always. So when, when my parents. And what do you um, learn or what do you see or do you go, Phew. They got to learn from us. Sometimes. Bro. And sometimes, and we do get a lot of calls from other public markets who um, maybe are struggling or fledgling markets or new startup markets that they want to come visit our market. And we certainly have a lot to learn from some of the way more successful markets, the granddaddies here in America, you know, the Pike Place, the Reading Terminal, all of those, most of which have at some point in their histories um, faced closure uh, or the building being raised or something awful. Certainly City Market here in Indianapolis has faced that and the public outcry was so strong because people are so emotionally tied to their public market that they weren't even about to have it. And we haven't even um, had talked about the farmer's market, which is yeah. different. I mean, that's on a 70 degree day, you can't even get through there. It's amazing. Yeah. And that's that, you know, kind of that return to the agricultural component of the market where it really started. Um, and then, you know, over time became kind of that lunch counter and now is more of a cultural campus. We have so much to do, so many things going on. Uh, that East Plaza that we re-envisioned, reimagined a couple of years ago and now has the rain garden and the bocce courts and the ping pong tables and the giant Jenga sets and the parklet. And, and the and, YMCA is, and the I mean, YMCA, the bike hub is terrific. The bike hub is just busy all the time those guys are just fantastically busy um, but i think really getting out of our silo as the city market is a destination you know downtown and especially market east now has several public places to visit whether it's the um cummins plaza or the new luger plaza at city county building oh, it's terrific it's fantastic but we all need to again collaborate and make sure that the consumer has the most robust experience as possible because you can use all of these great outdoor spaces in different ways so making sure that they get moved around and really enjoy those spaces also in the market to the extent for years it was the only game in town sure there right right i mean legal beagle but i mean it was sui generous in that part of the city now there are so many options to eat within right. you know a nine iron of where the city market is you, yeah. you really have to be you got whole foods that cafeteria coming online and public the starbucks greens public greens just opened ago. i was gonna say yeah. that's right so so it's amazing uh one last cl question for amena because well i don't know stevie travels a lot too but amena when you were around and you do a lot of things with other journalists and other newspapers because the gannett network is huge right. what do they say about indianapolis what do you hear when people bring up or you bring up where you work, where you live. Wait, did, did I tell you the story about how I was um, in an Uber um, in D.C. and my driver was from Nepal? And is, he asked me where I was from and I said Indianapolis. And the first thing he said was, Mike Pence? That's right. <laughs> and I joked, I kind of longed for the days when it used to be Bobby Knight. <laughs> and that's not a slam. I'm just saying things have become so politicized. He was in now. the news. I agree. <laughs> yeah. um, so, but I, I think Indianapolis is getting a good reputation because things are happening here. And where I used to feel like we followed a lot of trends, kind of Brooklynized ourselves, I feel like Indianapolis is starting some trends. So I'll hear from friends back in Phoenix. Oh, you guys are doing this cool like Ali Bocce tournament. Right. You know, let's bring that here to Phoenix. So I see other cities picking up what Indianapolis has done. And that's a totally different place than it was a decade ago. And yeah. you could never have predicted it when, like, when I was in high school. 
I mean, the Pain Aim Games was, I was, I just left, but the Pain Aim just left to go in the army, but the Pain Aim Games was, I think, I forget who was someone, one of our, uh, I think it was Bill Benner said that the podcast that came out earlier, but the pain name games changed so much. It was just this, and you don't even, I don't even know if it still exists. Maybe it does, but it, at the time it was just huge. And, and you know, it's, it was just 35 or so years ago that you had to, the city had to have a telethon to keep the Pacers from folding. Right. Right. That's right. And think about that and think about 30 years after that, we hosted a Super Bowl and knocked it out of the park and created a template for every other city that has to hold a Super Bowl after us. That's right. We've come to the world famous, much copied five question segment of Leaders and Legends podcast. We're here with Stevie Stays and Amanda Kingsbury. And so I was not happy with my first question and the litany of questions, which was your first car because the answers were kind of uh, opaque. So we've changed that. So we're gonna go I ask you, Stevie, and then Amanda can answer, and we'll go through all five. Okay. And so the first, the new first question is, Stevie, what was your first job? Like out of college or in? No. Okay. First job oh, that gosh. you got paid to do? Uh, corn detasseling. <laughs> oh God, it was awful too. Who's um, your rite of passage? Right, but if you're from Southern Indiana, you know, and you grew up in a rural community, your first job's probably going to be corn detasseling. Um, and there was a lot of camaraderie. You know, you do it with all of your friends and the three that you go, the three that are in your class. Um, you still have the calluses? I, it was terrible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then I, I was worked at a, a swimming pool. I was on the swim team from like age three until I was out of school, and um, I worked lifeguard for many years. Amanda? I worked for a landscaping company and I got fired after two days and my dad's best friend owned the company. Oh no. I what know. were you doing? Well, there were these big <laughs> machines that I was unable <laughs> to operate and I was always bothering the other guys because they were all guys but me to please come help me operate this machine, thus taking them away from their own responsibilities. <laughs> I got a good tan over two days and uh, hey, <laughs> it's <was> fun. <laughs> uh, what was your first concert? Stevie? Oh, it was terrible. I'm embarrassed to even say. Oh, we've um, had some doozies. <laughs> it was Loverboy. And I can still. They're great. No, they were never great. Well, they're great. No, and I can remember distinctly being at this concert, watching Loverboy perform on stage, and, and the lead singer, whose name Mike I can't Reno. remember. Yeah. Um, you know, had like the tight leather red <laughs> pants on and a white t shirt. And all he would do was like turn around with his back to the audience and shake his butt and the crowd would go crazy. I'm like, are you people for real? Like this is all it takes to get everybody super. This is just dumb. If you're on stage, that's if pretty you're much on all stage, it takes. Absolutely. It doesn't work for me at the city market, but yes, <laughs> on stage it can be it could be a winner. Which uh, which year? Which album? Do you remember? Oh, what, working for the weekend, whatever that was on. I mean, it was in Terre Haute. It was at yeah. Holman So early Center. 80s, they were big. I get that. Yeah. I get that. Yeah. Amanda? My parents took me to see Eddie Rabbit <laughs> when I was in seventh grade. I love a rainy <laughs> night. I love a rainy night. <laughs> at the <laughs> Star Theater in Maryville. What was the first concert you went to on your own? Scratch? Night Ranger at the Pavilion in Chicago. Uh-huh. So don't Tell Me You Love Me that's and Sister the, Christian. Yeah, exactly That's right. contemporaneous with... Uh -huh. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Lover Boy. <laughs> if you could <laughs> recommend... Uh, we'll let Amanda go first this time. If you could recommend any book for someone to someone so they could read it and be enlightened or feel smarter or anything, which book would you recommend? Um, you know who I'm really into right now is Roxanne Gay. And, um, who I don't, she, for maybe I'm not familiar. She's a feminist author. She was based at Purdue for a while, but she left and went to, um, LA I would just recommend a couple of books by her, one called Bad Feminists and another one called Difficult Women. And um, you and I would learn? You would learn a lot about women's experiences that maybe they don't often publicly talk about, but a lot of experiences and thoughts that we might all share. Excellent. Stevie? Oh, I'm reading it now and I can't remember the title. It's Brene Brown. Um, Amanda's shaking her head. She knows who Brene Brown she is. She writes about vulnerability and Vulnerability mm -hmm. and has had several TED Talks. But this book is particularly about, again, kind of building those re resilient communities and that human interaction, that human connection, that human engagement. No, um, wilderness, into the wilderness or out of them. 
braving the wilderness. Thank you very much. Um, and how important it is to not only fill our own souls with that human connection and interaction, but that's that's how we kind of build and maintain these great communities with our friends and people that we know and love, and and with social media and all of the you know. FaceTime that we get with our computers and with our phones and tablets and otherwise, um, making sure that we maintain that with our with our people. I'd there, also recommend Ferdinand the Bull. Remember the children's book? Oh, Best yes. thing ever. Yeah. Sometimes you just need to sit under the tree and enjoy life. Right? <laughs> Did you know, by the way, and I'm going to say this, do you know Irvington has a podcast? No, I have you no should, idea. I'll, we, we need to talk about that because okay. a friend of mine from high school is involved with it. They heard this podcast and they reached out to me to be on theirs great thing about being on an east side podcast is there's no language restrictions right <laughs> yeah, you say whatever you want there is no expletive deleted button uh if you could witness any event in history stevie be there when it happened not watch on tv but be there any event in history what would you choose oh my goodness um i can remember watching on tv the wall coming down the berlin wall coming down i think great answer yeah friends of mine actually did go and be part of that amazing experience. I think I would love to be there. Um, yeah. Amanda? Uh, when women got the right to vote, that would have been one fun mm -hmm. after party to be at. So the actual, um, I don't know what the last state was to ratify the amendment. I'm not sure either, but I just think that would have been. A well, there's really a state that's called the equality state. And that wasn't, I don't think it's Wyoming. I have to think about it, but hmm. that might have been it. Um, Last question. Go ahead. You ran something else. Oh no, that's it. Last question. If you could have dinner with anyone in the world, Amanda, who would you choose? Two hours, is wherever the, you want. Again, is this alive or dead? Or? No, you had your chance on the dead question <laughs> on the history part. We're alive this time. Oh, hmm. two hours. Talk about whatever you want. Well, I'm going to go see Cher on Valentine's Day, oh. so it'd be great if she and I could hang out for a couple of hours at you know, St. Elmo's ahead of time or afterwards. <laughs> yeah. I love it. <laughs> Cher. Cher's been through a lot. Cher's a survivor. Mm -hmm. That's true. So I have to go with, can I pick two? Can I pick one dead and one alive? No. Okay. <laughs> Has to be alive. You want to have lunch with a dead person? Well, I, okay, so alive. So... A lot of people are going to make fun of me. So because. have in dinner with anyone in the world living right now for two hours and you can talk about whatever you want. Who would it be? Well, I'm going to say Bono. From just a humanitarian, philanthropic. I feel like I could be so inspired by that conversation to do even more, uh, you know, amazing things. Like I, I would walk away just in awe. And when I call you Stevie and I'm placed on hold, what do I hear? You hear you too. Yeah. <laughs> Have you heard about that private Facebook group for you two fans where they take crotch shots of the band? Um, I've heard of this. Yeah. I tried to find it. I couldn't find okay. it. Okay. I know somebody who knows somebody. <laughs> <laughs> this vast audience of millions for leaders and legends, please help Stevie out on the crotch shot cam oh <laughs> for future reference. It's been an absolute delight. I, I can't tell you how much I enjoy the friendship of both of you. You have both been uh, amazingly kind to me in my good times and bad. And I'm very, very grateful that you have shown up today. Amanda Kingsbury and Stevie Stays, thank you very much. You know I adore you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at 